nobody coming to protect us. We got to start our own life. I understand. France, your waste kills. Do not dump your waste on Indian soil. Do not. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Zerva Oya with me, Zerva. In the past few months, especially, I have kept up with the news about what is going on in the United States of America regarding the Black Lives Matter movement and also how law enforcement is clashing with people of color, specifically the black communities. And it just breaks my heart. In my humble opinion, various individuals from both sides, if we have to even box it into different boxes, have their own plus and minuses in the way that they approach and handle the situation, which is another topic in itself that is very complicated and very sensitive. However, but I wholeheartedly believe that systematic racism exists. And this systematic racism oftentimes leads into various injustices out there. As someone who currently lives in the global south and has lived as a minority in various parts of the world in my past, I can witness that systematic racism does exist and this just hinders a lot of efforts out there that have been going on for us to build just societies where we can also thrive within it. And a lot of people are clearly tired of it. Racial minorities and indigenous groups are oftentimes excluded from the narrative, excluded from politics, from urban planning, that oftentimes when it comes to policy making, they are not included. That when it comes to combining various perspectives of a certain issue or various issues, they are not involved within policy making and this really does exclude them and also hinder them in the future to come. As we know, this is a deep-rooted issue that's been passed down from generation to generation. I'm tired of telling you, I'm 45 years old. 45 and I'm 31. And I'm tired of seeing Ain't nobody coming to protect us. We got to start our own I understand. He angry at 46. I'm angry at 31. You angry at 16. So Putting yourself in harm's way is not the way. No, it's not. You and then other your counterparts, the same Asian that has that same power. Y'all come up with a better way. Cause we ain't doing it. And I have a five-year-old son. And it ain't happening. I marched four years ago. Keep my mind stopped. Did the same y'all doing. The same exact thing night after night after night. It don't matter. Come up with a better way. You understand me? You keep yourself safe. And we need to change it somehow. Because my YouTube channel primarily addresses about environmental issues, I would like to share with you my thoughts, my perspectives regarding environmental racism. And what are your rights as to not experience environmental racism anywhere you are in this world? Because there is no climate justice without racial justice. This subtopic of racism or environmental racism apparently is not something that a lot of people are aware of, if at all. It actually exists in a lot of parts of the world. So not only the United States, not only in Indonesia where I come from, but other countries as well. And the way that it manifests depends on the situation and the background of the issue. First of all, we need to know that environmental racism exists as the inverse of environmental justice. And uniquely, environmental justice also is the response towards environmental racism. Now, environmental justice refers to those cultural norms and values, behaviors, policies, rules, regulations, and decisions, hopefully, by government and corporations to support sustainability, where all people can be assured that their natural environment and community is safe and sustainably productive. Environmental justice exists when all people can realize their highest potential without the blockages of environmental racism 
or inequity that deliberately intentionally targets certain communities or certain countries for locally destructive land uses and also environmentally exploitative actions and intentional neglect based on race or background, whether blatantly or not. These are some examples that support environmental justice. Environmental racism exists when none or only a few of the aforementioned exists. This is when environmental risks are allocated disproportionately along the lines of race or background, oftentimes without the adequate input of these affected communities, whether it is the minority groups of people of color or indigenous groups, and if it's from abroad or like cross borders, it is without the consultations of the nations and the societies of these emerging economies and these developing countries. And there is also a disproportionate impact of environmental hazards that results out of this. That is an example of environmental racism. They, we, because I'm also a person of color, have to hold the brunt of such an oppressive system and this has been going on for decades. We need to acknowledge all of this, this exists globally and it is not a light matter. Before I take you around the world and show you what environmental racism looks like globally, I would like all of us here that's watching to focus on the United States first because it is currently where the hotspot of anti-racism movements are. Based on a 20-year comparative study by sociologist Robert Bollard that was released in 2007, race in the US is more important than social economic status in predicting the location of US commercial hazardous waste facilities. Polluting industries are often located in the middle of or nearby to minority communities. This indicates that regulations and business decisions are strongly dependent on not only socioeconomic but also race status in the area. Scientists have also stated that based on the results of their research that at the national, state and county levels, non-whites are disproportionately burdened compared to whites. African American children are five times more likely to experience lead poisoning compared to their Caucasian counterparts. Such as from lead paint or specifically the presence of benzene and other dangerous aromatic chemicals that exist in playgrounds and also other public facilities. Differences in quality. An estimated 70% of the US's contaminated waste sites are located close by to low income housing. The National Center for Environmental Assessment announced that black people are exposed to particular matter one and a half times more than white people, and that Hispanics have approximately 1.2 exposure to particulate matter compared to non Hispanic whites. And this has to do with poverty, obviously. So the study also stated that people who live below the poverty line are exposed to particular matter 1.3 times more compared to those living above the poverty line. Basically, the magnitude of pollution emissions from individual factories appears to be higher in minority group neighborhoods that are usually impoverished areas consisting of people from the lower socioeconomic groups populated primarily by POCs or people of color. Have you heard of CBA? CBA is cost-benefit analysis. It is an analytical process that places a monetary value on costs and benefits to evaluate issues. In short, well, if you're not able to pay for clean air, clean water, sanitation, well, screw you. Too bad. You're not getting these qualified services but if you can pay more you will get more now let's take a look at environmental racism around the world all around the globe whether in diversely mixed societies with environmentally disadvantaged minority groups or developing countries or emerging economies that strike unfair deals with so-called developed countries or more advanced economies people of color bear a greater burden of health until social economic problems that result from higher exposure such as to waste and pollution until getting robbed from land exploitation and degradation. This can occur due to many things. 
from unsafe or unhealthy work conditions where regulations don't exist or they do but they're not implemented properly and plus salary and wages usually in these MNCs are much more lower for locals neighborhoods that are uncomfortably close to toxic materials, toxic chemicals and so the quality reduction and number reduction of environmental resources, natural resources because of exploitative extraction with global climate change, it also complicates everything even more. The overlap has disproportionately affected different communities and populations throughout the world due to disparities in social, economic, and racial background status. Look at the global south where, for example, byproducts of climate change affect various global south countries who oftentimes throughout history contribute relatively less to climate change in terms of metrics like carbon dioxide emissions, but have far fewer resources to ward off the impacts of climate change that are localized. They are not the main contributing countries when it comes to the production of greenhouse gas emissions. But they are disproportionately more vulnerable to man-made climate impacts that naturally spread throughout the globe. Example, look at the small islands around us. One that is very popular that we know that is drowning is the Maldives. Also remember, a lot of the factories that are owned by the Global North, they are located in the Global South and that is for specific reasons. And don't forget, there are also a lot of cases about greenwashing, which is another story to tell. Look up about the French aircraft carrier Clemenceau that tried to smuggle tons of hazardous materials, including asbestos and PCBs, into Alang, an Indian shipbreaking yard. France, your waste kills. Do not dump your waste on Indian soil. Do not contaminate our workers and our soil. In Indonesia, we have various issues. One of the examples is the PLTU Batubara or coal-driven electric steam power plants that are funded by the South Korean and Japanese governments. Late last year, the Indonesian people of Banten, helped by a few South Korean environmental activists, they filed a lawsuit, specifically a preliminary injunction lawsuit towards the South Korean government specifically the South Korean financial body. Through the high court there, they stated in the lawsuit that they want the South Korean government to stop the funding, to stop the continuing of the investments that is given towards this Pelta Batubara, namely Java 9 and Java 10, that is located in the Bantan area. I mean, can you see the double standards, the hypocrisy here? South Korea government and also the Japanese government have very strict environmental laws in terms of environmental pollution specifically. That is why the air over there is crispy clean. But they are willing to invest in this environmentally toxic project abroad. They overlook the fact that coal-powered power plants accelerate early death and also is hazardous for health. Look up about the environmental racism by the Netherlands, where they shipped dirty diesel from Amsterdam and Rotterdam Harbor to African countries, taking advantage of lax pollution regulations there. The diesel contained a hundred times more sulfur than is allowed by European regulation. Also, let's look at a South American country, Ecuador. They, including their indigenous communities, experienced a great loss of agriculture, which also affects the rise of poverty levels and a rise in health problems because Texaco, an American oil company, did not properly dispose of its hazardous waste caused by oil extraction activities in the Lago Agrio oil field, causing great damages to the ecosystem and crippling communities. And all of these are just a few examples. Now, to better understand all of these complicated dynamics, why it exists in various countries, why it exists globally, we need to dissect the dimensions of environmental racism. This will also then help us to see the direct link between economic, environmental, and also health issues so we can demand for safer environments. This is the four dimensions of environmental racism by the Slow Factory Foundation. Environmental racism exists because of internalized, interpersonal, institutional, and structural factors. Interpersonal dimension is more about cultural and unconscious biases that exist in systemic societal interactions that creates that racism. It's like 
criticism is a given, so deal with it kind of thing, but no. The internalized dimension is when there is a lack of representation of POCs in the political sector, for example. And this glosses over the disadvantages, mutes or even silences the voices of the POCs. And this exacerbates the tone deafness of POC representation in various discussions. This could also give a sense of inferiority and self-hate in the long run if not careful because of these embedded narratives. Structural dimension is when there are existing policies that limits the movement of POCs or minorities, including indigenous people, for example, where they are disempowered to own or even cultivate land. Institution dimension is when racist values and standards are made with the aim to exploit disadvantaged communities for the exploiters' benefits giving pressure for lower wages and lower salaries and also exploiting lax environmental regulations and not really making it better over there and of course these are all possible because there are corrupt leaders which is also part of the whole strategic plan now after we understand how the dimensions of environmental racism is mapped out we can then connect it to the larger dimensions of racism itself like this graph over here. The dimensions are the same, but the effect is even a more broader scope of the understanding of what racism is. No matter your race, your background, where you come from, you deserve environmental justice. Nature deserves environmental justice. For people of color, indigenous group, vulnerable groups, build support and solidarity amongst yourselves. But also don't forget to build bridges with those who are more privileged than us. Make those who are still sleeping to wake up because at the end of the day, we need to work together. If you live in an area where you suffer from environmental pollution, or any forms of destruction of your neighborhood for others' profit. Confront power structures through involving yourself through professions that help change that, that drive for change. Help change policy. Even if it feels like you're losing a battle, you know, you're, not, you're not winning a battle that you're destined to lose kind of feeling. Participate in organized peaceful protests, marches, legal actions, build conversations online to spark discussions, to spark thoughts among people. Use social media, build awareness, attend or build public hearings. Write or meet your representatives in government. Write or meet corporate representatives. There are various activities and approaches that you can do that are legal. Make those people accountable. See you in the next video. Thank you for watching.